and we are going to speak about technology private market investment opportunities landscape how to get access to the hottest technology placement and our moderator is going to be Elizaveta Pershina Elizaveta Pershina partner at Uvecoin Venture Fund and the panelists are Nick Mutsin Ik Kanu and Enena and Kongno. I want to be sure that I'm spelling all, all the things right. I'll help you, Sergei. Uh, no worries. Uh, so thank you so much. Uh, hello, everyone. And uh, welcome to our panel discussion today uh, devoted to private market investment opportunities and the access to the hottest technology placements. Um, uh, I'm very honored to be uh, the host of uh, this uh, panel today. So uh, we are going to have uh, four uh, experts. Uh, I.K. Kanu, the founder of Atlantic Ventures. Uh, he's from uh, Nigeria. Uh, Nena uh, Nonyo, uh, a principal at Digital Growth Africa, also from Nigeria. Uh, Nice to meet you. Uh, Yana Leoneva, the private investment group uh, ambassador. Uh, she's an expert uh, in Arab, uh, United Arab Emirates and uh, uh, lives there. Uh, and uh, Nick Mitsushin, uh, chief investment uh, officer of uh, ABRT uh, from uh, San Francisco. Uh, welcome uh, to the panel discussion today. Um, I give you uh, some time uh, to introduce yourself. And also, uh, I would like uh, to ask you one question. Um, uh, could you please uh, provide me with uh, your opinion on uh, how would uh, each of you define hot technology placement, what it is for you? Thank you, and uh, you're welcome. Let's start with IK. Hi, everyone. A pleasure to be here. Um, so my name again, I.K. Kanu, founder of Atlantico Ventures, and we're an African-focused fund investing in the next generation of mission-driven entrepreneurs building tech and tech-enabled uh, companies. So for us, what a hot technology investment, I'll say it differs from market to market, but in Africa, we're looking for entrepreneurs that are using technology to solve problems that exist in that market, but also could be skills to other markets. So we're not looking for entrepreneurs that are taking crazy bets, but looking for things that we know requires the right technology, but a sound business model and sound execution and sound business development to help them, to help them excel. Thank you so much, uh, Nena. Uh, the stage is yours. Hi, uh, thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure again uh, to echo IK to be here. Thank you for having me. So my name is Nen Nankongo and uh, I am a princip the principal investor at Digital Growth Africa or Digame, uh, which is a permanent capital vehicle uh, that we formed in 2016 to invest in tech and tech enabled businesses across Africa. Um, we typically deploy between two and $10 million in uh, high growth founding teams that are um, really solving some of the key challenges that we see across Africa. Um, you know, vis-a-vis -vis hot tech placement, I think I would just say that uh, for us, we're really looking for strong teams, um, high growth, and really a, an expertise or fit between not only product and market, but really the team and product. Uh, Okay, sorry, we just switched around on the screens. Um, yeah, but I think, uh, look, I'm excited to be here um, because there's so much going on uh, across the African continent and I'm pleased uh, to be able to help shepherd uh, and build the next generation of African businesses. Thank you so much. Um, Jana, we would like to hear you. Jana, you are with us. Yes, hi, sorry. Um, so good evening or good afternoon, whatever time zone you are in. I'm currently stuck in Russia, <laughs> even though I represent the United Arab Emirates. And um, 
Um, so my name is Jana Leonova. I have been a pure cosmopolitan in my life. I was born and raised in the USSR. Then I lived in Switzerland. Then I spent eight years in the UK. Um, I was very often in the United States, but last two years I am based in Dubai. And um, I just love the place and I'm actively involved in uh, fundraising. Um, I bring uh, foreign projects that would like to enter the local market and raise funds and we organize we were organizing various events before the whole situation uh, just by um, uh, assembling local investors and in the projects that would like to participate in various programs in Europe and bring in European or Russian or let's say American um, startups that would like to enter the local markets. So um, today I will be speaking on behalf of the United Arab Emirates uh, market and discussing trends, what are hot now in the OAE. Uh, now I am a part of the private investment group. It's a group uh, that is bridging uh, Europe and uh, Emirates, I would say. We have one office in Abu Dhabi and another office is in uh, Monaco. So um, you all know that uh, the current situation with COVID has re really shifted uh, a lot of trends and a lot of priorities uh, these days. Whatever was important like three months ago is no more relevant. Like for example, now in the OAE, the main concern is about uh, security, food security and health security. Because for example, in um, food, it's about 95% of all food is just uh, imported from abroad. So now with all the situation with the you know, the supply chain is not working fine with all this uh, closing borders. Um, the United uh, Arab Emirates understood that important is to secure its own food and it's important is to secure its own health. So these are like really the hottest trends and there are a lot of allocations on the governmental level, you know, on the level of Emirates, on the federal level, on the level of private companies. Um, so that's what we are really intensively searching now. Thank you, Jana. That was very full introduction. Um, now uh, I'm inviting uh, Nick to the stage. Uh, thanks, thanks, Lisa. Can I share the screen to show a couple slides, or what's the best way? Because if I sure, do it, you have yeah. uh, don't forget you have two minutes for introduction. Yeah, yeah. Enjoy. Just a couple slides. Do you see that? Sure. Good. Yeah, so a little bit about us. Uh, we've been working since 2006, almost 14, 15 years already. Some good brands we've co-invested with, build a venture ecosystem. And then there's a the whole idea about the technology placements is how create this venture ecosystem able to source the most interesting technology companies. So that's, that's what I'm really excited to share. Some of the brands that we worked with on this slide some good numbers, number of investments we did, IRR numbers, financial numbers, and then also good partners. So this is something that we did in San Francisco with Sequoia Capital, which is investor of, you see this Google and Yahoo here on this. So we did a number of programs, good friends with Steve Blank. So it's been, it's been an interesting journey. So that's uh, how we see this whole venture ecosystem. And now we create this a digital platform for the venture market that uh, connects all the startups, gets uh, founders together, mentors, experts, and uh, brings the quality deal flow to the top tier uh, institutional uh, venture capital funds. So this is a little bit, this is a little bit about us. Thank you guys. Thank you so much, uh, Nick. Uh, so now we are moving to a Q and A uh, session. Uh, so IK, the question uh, for you, uh, how do you see uh, what uh, were the major uh, changes uh, in the landscape of uh, tech investments, uh, which uh, took place in uh, recent two, three years time? And uh, uh, what do you see, what uh, kind of tech companies uh, do investors uh, are looking for and how? Okay, so... Uh... I'll say the first wave of early stage investing in most of Sub-Saharan Africa started off as a FinTech revolution. So you saw a lot of transfer businesses, a good amount of payments businesses, and some merchant acquiring businesses. 
And the reason for this is because most African economies were predominantly cash-based. For example, Nigeria at the time, I'll say in the early um, 90s, I'll say it was predominantly 100% cash-based. And that was a big issue. So a number of companies started developing solutions to try to actually move people from cash towards digital because that was the dominant issue at that point in time. Now there's been a wave of a lot of these companies and the new problems that are arising because now that people have access to them paying with either cards or mobile money or any other form of digital payments, now they want other things. Now they're looking for insurance. Now they're looking for asset management. Now they're even looking for trading services, for example, buying stocks locally or abroad. So that's how it's changed over time, given in one sector. But I'll say the good thing is that because you've seen early successes in the fintech sector, there are a number of entrepreneurs now taking other bets and saying, well, there are other problems to solve in the ecosystem. There are other problems in education in healthcare and logistics or major, major problems to be solved. And because you, you start seeing VCs recognizing that the entrepreneurs are making strides in those areas and solving those areas, you started seeing other sectors start becoming more prominent. So now there's been a wave of logistics companies being funded and doing well across Africa. There's been a, a wave of health tech and health insurance companies being funded. And I think this will continue over the years as you start seeing entrepreneurs taking more and more bets and solving bigger and bigger problems because as their customers get more sophisticated, the problems and the solutions have to become more sophisticated and the tools they use become more sophisticated. So that's something I've seen over the past few years and I'll keep on evolving as time goes along. And in turn, and so the other question? Uh, the other question is, uh, uh, that was uh, what kind of uh, tech companies do investors are looking for and how? The interesting question is uh, how to get to those quotas. Yeah. So the how to get to them, I would say it's the best method that works for us is referrals from other startups. So when you're more active in the ecosystem, helping entrepreneurs, even though you may not invest in them, but you recognize that they have something and help them get across the line or refer them to the VCs, that sticks within the ecosystem because a lot of what the startups are looking for is not just cash. They're looking for someone that can actually sit down with them and help them through the business model and execution because that's what they, that's what they really starve for uh, in the uh, ecosystem. So once you have that recognition and that brand, the best type of referrals you get are from other startups because they know what you're looking for, they know how you work, and they can easily make those introductions. And startups, they always commingle one engineer, one founder moves from one to the next, and that just always keeps on circulating. So I'll say that's the best method in terms of getting out there, really helping them be front-facing in the ecosystem. Thank you. That's a great suggestion. Um, thank you. Uh, I also want to ask uh, Nena the same question. Uh, Nena, uh, as uh, I know that uh, you and uh, Ike are good friends, uh, and uh, uh, you guys probably uh, have uh, different opinions, though, on um, how the world is changing and uh, what is uh, the situation right now. Uh, please sh share your experience. How do you see that uh, in Nigeria? What uh, changes uh, in the landscape of uh, tech uh, investments uh, and um, the investor's behavior maybe? So I'll um, answer the question in a way that, that kind of uh, uh, highlights how um, different people um, can just come at things with different perspectives. So I don't know that we necessarily think uh, differently, but we might take a, a different approach. Um, when you asked me the question, what's changed uh, in the technology investing landscape in Africa over the past few years, um, I was just going to use one word and say more, 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 more. Um, that's what we've seen over the past few years. Um, I'm going to quote a few statistics. You know, in 2015, so we got our permanent capital vehicle off, off the ground uh, with the first close in 2016. And uh, according to, to Partech, um, there was $277 million in terms of volume of venture capital deals in Africa in 2015. For 2019, they reported $2 billion. And the same thing for 
um, the number of VC rounds, um, you know, seeing anywhere from 150 to 533% um, increases in the number of VC rounds or VC investments that um, people are making across the continent. And we've seen, again, more in the same trend around round sizes. So, um, you know, sort of double digit, uh, you know, just shy of 100% in terms of increases in the sizes of rounds from seed all the way to growth. And so this more, more, more means that um, entrepreneurship is more viable in Africa. And as Ike said, uh, in using sort of the uh, trail from FinTech to logistics and education and healthcare, we're seeing more founders look to use technology to solve many of the challenges that are present across Africa. Um, and so um, in terms of, you know, how do you find, um, you know, what's hot? I, I think from, from where I sit, it's always about team. Um, and it, it comes down to, as Ike said, um, you know, relationships or the cash plus. Um, with uh, an increased number of investors doing deals, the question is, how do you differentiate yourself as an investor to founders? And the real thing is, how do you add value to that team? And every individual VC and VC firm will do it slightly differently. But, you know, the reality is, is that for those people that are outside of African markets and, and see the kind of opportunities that we do, I would encourage you to partner with people that are on the ground that are, you know, know these entrepreneurs, have a broad perspective around them. And that is the best way to sort of access a hot deal. So if you're sitting in, I don't know, Brazil, and you want to do something in Africa, I don't know that I would necessarily pick up the phone to the first African person I found and said, I'm going to do that deal. I think I would, I would look to work with trusted counterparts um, to help you really vet those, those opportunities. Um, yeah, I think that's that's my way of saying I agree with him, but maybe we just came at the answer in a slightly different way. I can see that uh, Ike also agrees with you. <laughs> uh, well, we don't want to make this panel too boring um, if everybody just agrees with everybody. <laughs> yeah, but uh, I'm happy to hear your opinion on that. Um, now I would like uh, to ask uh, Jana, as uh, she has uh, great experience uh, in. Uh, a uh, very unique market, which is uh, United uh, Arabic Emirates. Uh, Jana, please uh, tell us uh, what's the uniqueness of uh, the investment environment there and uh, what can we see at the moment? Um, I would say that uh, OIE is really a very uh, innovative country. They're very much welcoming innovations and technologies. They're seeking for the best uh, projects uh, all around the globe, and they are ready to invest and ready, you know, to 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 bring and to host uh, those projects uh, back to the OAE. Uh, the only thing they want to see also that this project, this company, also giving back. They're not just passing by and you know uh, deriving some uh, investments and going away. They want to build long-term relationships. They want to see also commitments. Uh, they are ready to give, you know, allocations and uh, talents and uh, support with the laws and other governmental programs and uh, various accelerator and incubators programs. There are really tons of them, especially in Abu Dhabi, in Dubai, in Sharjah, for any types of company from seeds to you know to companies that want to scale, to grow, and so on, so on. So. Um, so that's what they want to see, a long-term commitment, a long-term relationship. But otherwise, it's a very much uh, innovation-oriented um, country. They really want to drive away from oil and petroleum. It was like years ago. Uh, now they're really excelling in innovations. Like, for example, do you know that uh, uh, Emirates is the first country to appoint the Minister of Artificial Intelligence so they are the first uh, Arab nation that uh, sent the astronaut to the space last year, actually together with the Russian astronauts. <laughs> We're proud of that. Helped them. Yes, it was like a joint uh, program, but they really want to be the best, the first, you know, they implement blockchain. There are blockchain on various levels from police to, to, to state to land registration and uh, so on and so on. Uh, as I told that, yes, this COVID situation 
has really shifted focuses and the main priority is now um, uh, health tech and agro tech. And uh, for example, for health tech, I can tell you that uh, today it was announced that the OAE became one of the 15 countries uh, deploying coronavirus digital health passport. Also today they announced a special award dedicated to uh, top innovative practices in handling COVID-19. So what is good about the uh, Emirates, maybe because it's like one leadership, decisions are really made very quickly. You know, they're really adapting, they're very flexible, they are agile, the whole structure is really, you know, following trends quickly and they setting up trends also quickly. And, you know, as uh, Darwin said, um, it's not the most uh, uh, clever that survives, but the most adaptable. So that's also probably like the key of, uh, of their success. Um, I would like to say that also like last week, for example, it was announced that they uh, set up uh, like the biggest retail e-commerce uh, free zone in Dubai, next to Dubai airport. Uh, it will be like 870 US dollars uh, zone. Uh, it will be the biggest in the whole MENA region. And again, uh, there will be new opportunities for tech projects related to retail, supply chain, you know, um, warehouses, logistics, especially powered by artificial intelligence. So like companies that are looking in this field, uh, also, I think they're very welcome to um, participate. Yana, uh, sorry to interrupt you. I wanted to ask you the question about uh, women in, uh, uh in uh, arabic emirates please uh, tell us is it true that they're not it's not possible for them to invest and there are no opportunities for them because this is a special country no 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 there are i think a lot of prejudice from uh, people who did not travel to the oae or just maybe traveled quickly as a tourist but in general um again there are a lot of programs especially dedicated to women and to female participation in politics, in innovations, in investments. Like, for example, do you know that the uh, UAE government consists of women, like 66% are women. So there are various business councils uh, for ladies. Uh, like, for example, in Sharjah Emirates, there are special, uh, like, dedicated uh, also areas for ladies various clubs, various uh, consultation services where lady can receive mentoring, um, advices, you know, find investments. Like another Emirate, Russell Haima, is offering like a special uh, business lady packages with a very big discount compared to like uh, normal packages. Um, you know, for example, uh, United Nation uh, has like a division devoted to women. It's called United Nation Women. And there are seven divisions all around the globe. So one of these division is sitting in, uh, in the OIE. And uh, what is also interesting and uh, worth paying attention to, it's not just a declaration, it's real, real acts. So there are really certain uh, activities in uh, this uh, way. And I attend a lot of conferences, a lot of forums, like the biggest JITEX, whatever it's happening. And I see a lot of ladies uh, representing their startups a lot of ladies, you know, speaking on the stage um, and so on. It's not only even about ladies. Uh, there are principles of exclusivity and diversification. So they have special also programs that just like um, targeting people with determination, you know, various uh, nationalities to integrate them to society, to give them equal opportunities and participate as innovators, as investors. Sorry, I see that you are very excited to, to talk about that, but uh, I have to interrupt you. Because I know. We have more questions to discuss. Uh, thank you so much for sh sharing your experience. Uh, and uh, I have uh, the question to Nick as well. I hope uh, he also uh, revealed the truth about uh, some of uh, the things. Uh, I know that uh, some of uh, government uh, programs uh, uh, prevent uh, smaller investors uh, from uh, investing in good projects because uh, those projects can get uh, cheaper financing from the government. Uh, and uh, this is 
um, problem for those small investors. How do you see, uh, uh, how, what is the solution? Nick, please tell us, how do you see? Thanks, Lisa. I still feel the wall is becoming more flat. Uh, look, uh, right now we're all from different countries, all connected here, and we have some good friends from uh, from Berkeley. Yeah. Sasha has just joined in her beautiful house in Piedmont, which is great. Uh, and that means we all get together in this uh, virtual environment, and it's really easy for us to see, uh, you know, South Africa here, um, you know, this uh, MENA region, which is Dubai. I mean, Europe, it's all connected now. So that's why I don't see the governments have a lot of power and control over talented companies. For example, for Eastern Europe, since it's uh, instability, lots of founders are now migrating to Western Europe, to the US, to Southeast Asia. So the more, the more uh, we move on, the more we move forward, the more open the world becomes and the more opportunities we have for entrepreneurs to tap into the sources of capital they prefer to avoid any kind of toxic money or government money when government wants really to control some technology or some company. And that's why we see more and more syndicates, I mean, uh, private capital coming into scene. That means uh, the, whole, uh, the whole environment is becoming more open. So uh, we've done uh, more than uh, 20 investments, like 27 investments, the 22 companies, and the syndicated deals. That, may, that, that means we always combine the private capital together with the institutional expertise, how to manage uh, those uh, technology companies, right? So as I said in the beginning, we've always worked with the leading venture capital firms. And that's what we prefer. Instead of going ahead and raising our own fund, we rather, we rather uh, promote those uh, top institutional venture capital firms to private capital and make it a win-win-win for everyone. Because uh, the best uh, firms, they guarantee the best IRR. They perform at the better level. So the more we can position it properly and kind of strengthen those offerings with this digital platform, with the venture ecosystem to connect and to make private capital work with the work, work with the leading VC funds, the more the more uh, benefits we see for the startups as well, because they get funded easily. So to me, uh, we see many opportunities for us to kind of scale that model and to engage more private capital, like family offices, high net worth individuals, investment bankers, to kind of join forces with the venture capital uh, professionals to actually deliver great, uh, great results and great outcomes for private technology companies, early stage companies. Thank you. Thank you so much for your opinion. And uh, I was uh, glad uh, to be uh, the moderator of this uh, panel. Uh, thanks everyone. And uh, I hope to see you soon again. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Okay, okay, Lisa, don't go so far. Oh, yes, yeah. we're here. Yes, we're here going to the next our panel. Our panelists are also here. Just let them introduce. In my understanding, we are going to talk about impact investment in MTech. What does it mean, MTech? I don't know. How we can unleash the collective intelligence of humanity through the growing power of technology. And I, I